This is probably one of the first times you've ever heard that skeletal muscle may have a correlation to brain health. That's just not something anybody talks it's about. It's the organ of longevity. It's crazy that that's not discussed. Right now, people talk about this obesity epidemic and that the diseases that ride along with obesity, for example, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, that these are end results of potentially obesity. What if I told you that the underpinning of all of these issues is not obesity? It's actually skeletal muscle. There's fat that infiltrates skeletal muscle. Healthy skeletal muscle looks like a filet. It doesn't look like a ribeye. And those changes begin decades before we see the result of these illnesses. And we always think about muscle as kind of like jacked and tan and the bro science. Yes. But it's so much more than that. When you lose muscle, you lose mitochondria. You lose the place of energy generation. You see elevated levels of blood sugar, elevated levels of insulin. Skeletal muscle loss is more detrimental to health and wellness than, in my opinion, gaining body fat. Muscle is the organ of longevity. Dietary protein will help protect your skeletal muscle as you eat. But these processed foods that I eat, they didn't really satiate me. Like I was hungrier yeah. within the hour as opposed to actually eating real protein. I am all about high quality protein. You could definitely be vegetarian or vegan and get away with it. But again, do I feel like that's best? I don't. Mm -hmm. Does it have to be red meat for the people out there who don't want to eat red meat? It doesn't, but you really have to evaluate why are you choosing not. Right, I think Arnold Schwarzenegger and some other people have gone vegan or already. And I mean, that's the worst thing that you can do for aging. Your survivability as you age is related to your muscle mass. Protein, we speak about it generically as if it's one thing. It's not. It's 20 different amino acids, all of which are in different ratios and they do different things. We don't have a requirement for quote protein per se. Mm -hmm. We have a requirement for those amino acids. Hey, it's Ed Mylad. I just wanted to thank you for being here and I would ask you to please subscribe to the show. If you just click the subscribe button here, I would really appreciate it. It helps the show grow so we can get even more successful guests on the program to help you. At the same time, if you're subscribed, you're going to get access to the programs before anybody else in the world gets access to them. So if you would, click subscribe right here. Thanks so much. All right, welcome back to the show, everybody. My guest today is a dear, dear friend of mine. Um, she's also my doctor. Uh, she is brilliant, and I use that word very rarely in my life. This is a brilliant woman, and today you are going to learn so much about your well-being, your fitness, your longevity, your energy, your strength that you have not heard before because what she does is very, very unique. I'm fortunate that she treats me. She also treats an awful lot of other very influential people on this planet that trust her with their care. And also, she's got a book out right now called Forever Strong, A New Science-Based Strategy for Aging Well. I trust her with my own care, and I trust her with all of you today. So here is Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. Welcome. Hi, Ed. It's so fun to be here. It's great to have you. I'm allowed to say this because she's like a sister to me. You look great. I told you <laughs> that when you walked in. Thank you so much. I Thank love you. that you embody what you preach uh -huh. and the results are very obvious with you she is jacked and shredded and has a ton of energy so all right let's get into it Can't a lot wait. of stuff i want to ask you that everybody wants to know the first thing is this there's some stuff in your book that you and i have never talked about and and i was really curious about it you make some kind of a case in the book for kind of muscle mass and the lack thereof of it in the potential of developing dementia or Alzheimer's and, and things that are cognitive decline type issues. I've never heard that before. Yeah. So we're going right to something that's really <laughs> unique in the book. But I love let's, that. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Um, right now, people talk about this obesity epidemic, mm -hmm. that we have an obesity epidemic as if it exists over here, and that the diseases that ride along with obesity, for example, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. that these are end results of potentially obesity. Mm -hmm. But what if I told you that the underpinning of all of these issues is not obesity? It's okay. actually skeletal muscle. Yeah, okay. And we've been trying to treat the wrong problem. And this became really clear to me. Do I have time to tell you a story? 100%. I did my fellowship in geriatrics and nutritional sciences mm -hmm. at Washington University. Mm -hmm. And 
during the day, I would see patients with dementia, Alzheimer's, end of life. Mm -hmm. In the hospital, nursing home rounds, you name it. And then in the mornings and in some evenings, I ran an obesity medicine clinic. Crazy. And you would think that these two things were separate. Right. Alzheimer's, aging, the diseases of aging, and then obesity. Mm -hmm. But there was one participant and her name, we'll call her Betty. Mm -hmm. she, and you know me very well. Mm -hmm. I'm a big hearted human. Very much so. And yeah. I just fell in love with this woman. Mm -hmm. She was a mom of three kids and she had always struggled to lose the same 20 pounds mm -hmm. over and over and over again. And we all know a Betty in our life. Mm -hmm. And I imaged her brain mm -hmm. and her brain looked like the beginning of an Alzheimer's brain. Mm -hmm. And we failed her. Mm -hmm. The medical society mm -hmm. and the information that we were providing about eat less exercise more mm -hmm. no one told her about taking care of skeletal muscle right resistance training protein and that was a huge mistake mm -hmm. she destroyed her muscle in the efforts of doing the right thing wow wow, wow. Okay. and then i started thinking that this was the advice that we were giving this was truly the advice that we were giving people and then I started seeing this similarity between all of my sickest patients, hmm. those in the dementia unit, those at end of life, those that were in the hospital. And it wasn't that they were fighting obesity. Hmm. It was that they all had unhealthy skeletal muscle. When you say unhealthy, is that the lack of it? The lack. Okay. And not only just the lack of skeletal muscle, when people gain weight, they often think about the fat that you can see. Mm -hmm. uh, subcutaneous fat, right. or we even talk about visceral fat, which is fat around the organs. But there's fat that infiltrates skeletal muscle. Mm. Healthy skeletal muscle looks like a fillet. It mm. doesn't look like a ribeye. Mm. Mm. And those changes begin decades before we see the result of these illnesses. Mm. There's a there's been um, there was a great pivotal study uh, out of Yale where they looked at 18 year old quote, healthy, sedentary students mm -hmm. with no obvious signs of fat, mm -hmm. right? No uh, abdominal fat. And they, just by being sedentary, showed that they had unhealthy skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle insulin resistance. Okay. Let's stay on that for a second. So, by the way, it's interesting. I'm thinking as you were talking because she's treated me for a long time. A lot of times when a doctor treats you... You don't need to know theoretically why they're doing what they're doing. You just sort of do what they tell you to do. <laughs> so now I'm reading the book of my doctor, and I'm like, wow, this whole premise based around healthy skeletal muscle is something I've actually never heard before, yet it's from my actual doctor. <laughs> then I start to think about you, me, many of the other people that I know that are friends of mine that you treat, and we all do, you, we all do have more obvious muscle on our yes. bodies than the average human being. I didn't know that's what you were doing the entire time with me. But you talked about this fillet versus a ribeye and the fat that accumulates inside skeletal muscle. What's the difference between those two? Like, So are you saying not all muscles made the same, or are you just saying a fat person has it inside their muscle well, that you can't see? Well, that's a great question. Okay. Um, there's all different fiber types of skeletal muscle, and no two people have the same. Okay. Okay? You are born with the amount of muscle fibers that you're going to have. You can make them bigger. You can also make them sicker. Okay. Healthy skeletal muscle remains healthy through activity. It There's this constant flux of substrate. So you go to the gym, you exercise, you're burning through muscle glycogen, there's fatty acid metabolism, all these metabolites that are necessary and part of the health of skeletal muscle. Okay. When you are sedentary, which by the way, 50% of Americans do not work out. Really, still? 24% of Americans meet their daily activity requirements. Mm. When you are not moving and you are sedentary, there is this decrease in flux, meaning that those carbohydrates, all of those um, substrates stay in the muscle, mm. which make it really unhealthy. It's kind of like this idea of a suitcase. Okay. So you open up a suitcase and let's say you're going on a trip for four days, but you're packing like you're going on a trip for 20. Okay. So you're overpacking all this clothes and the clothes has nowhere to go. It goes back out of the suitcase. Okay. It's exactly what happens when you don't have healthy skeletal muscle hmm. and you don't train it. You don't train it. So we'll talk about training in a minute because you said some brilliant things to me about my training in the past. But I want to stay on this just for a second. So let's just unpack a minute, everybody. This is probably one of the first times you've ever heard that skeletal muscle may have a correlation to brain health. That's just not something anybody talks it's about. It's the organ of longevity. It's crazy that that's not discussed secondarily. 
some of the things you're doing to, quote, lose weight that you think are healthy are actually causing you to have a problem accumulating more healthy skeletal muscle. Exactly. That's why this woman's on my show. That's why she's my doctor. So let's stay on this just for a second. And Ed, yes. one more thing. Okay. What if we stopped focusing? So we have this, quote, obesity epidemic. Right. That, by the way, we've only gotten fatter and more unhealthy. We've been trying to treat it for the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. My question to you is, if we had the paradigm right, if we were asking the right questions, mm -hmm. then wouldn't we be able to move towards a solution? We would. And one of the things you say in the book that I didn't know, I just let you do it to me, right? <laughs> and the way that you treat me and my diet and my workouts and my supplementation is that the accumulation of skeletal muscle, and maybe a lot of people do know this, but I think a lot don't. And I've been training in a gym for 30, 35 years. I've had every expert practically on the planet on my show, yet I never really put these two pieces together. But when we're talking about weight loss for a second, you submit in the book, maybe it's regular knowledge to most people, it just wasn't to me, that this healthy skeletal muscle helps with your metabolism and helps you actually burn fat. I didn't know that. I mean, that sounds basic to someone like you, but I think for most of us, I don't make a, I think I got to burn fat so that my muscle's more revealed. I don't know <laughs> the packing on skeletal muscle helps me burn fat. Well, so talk about yeah, that for yeah. a second. You know, it's interesting. Skeletal muscle is, has multiple roles in the body. Okay. And we always think about muscle as kind of like jacked and tan and the bro science. Yes. But it's so much more than that. Right. And I think that that's one reason why we haven't focused on it. Mm. We've just focused on, quote, adiposity. And we leave the, leave the skeletal muscle for the bros. Yes. But when we redefine its importance in, in health and medicine, we come up with a new framework. We come up with a framework called muscle-centric medicine. I got it in here, yep. And when we think about muscle as really the pinnacle of health and wellness, we start to draw on what are, what are its functions. Mm -hmm. For example, let's talk about the aging longevity trajectory. When you have healthy skeletal muscle, well, by the way, skeletal muscle at rest uses fatty acids. Okay. At rest, it just, it uses fatty acids. Skeletal muscle is a primary site for mitochondria, mm -hmm. your energy powerhouses. Okay. When you lose muscle, you lose mitochondria. You lose the place of energy generation, mm -hmm. which we see these changes, right? But mm -hmm. we're still chasing obesity. Let's still just chase obesity. Mm -hmm. When you lose skeletal muscle, you see elevated levels of blood sugar, yep. elevated levels of insulin. Mm -hmm. Skeletal muscle is your metabolic sink. Mm -hmm. It's what we talked about. It's your suitcase. Mm -hmm. That's one aspect of skeletal muscle. There's other aspects to skeletal muscle as it relates to health and wellness. Mm -hmm. It's an endocrine organ. Which means what? When you contract skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle secretes proteins and molecules called myokines. Yep which are anti-inflammatory okay. in the this way of they counterbalance the cytokine storm, the cytokine release in other cells that you hear about. Can we stay on that for a second? We can okay. say, of course. Okay. So everybody, in a minute, by the way, we're going to talk about how to accumulate it. Okay. But I want to stay on this because there's other stuff I'm reading in the book. Like, here's the truth. I don't get sick very often, right? Now, I've called you a couple of times going, hey, I'm going on a trip, and by the way, I'm wearing oh, wait, And here. also, let's say the truth, you right. travel more than 99.9% right. .9 of everybody, including yeah. some of your um, right. my, friends, my peers. Your peers. I out even travel down. <laughs> You're right. But one of the things that you say in the book, like, okay, I want to unpack what you were go where you were going, that there's an anti-inflammatory property to this as well. So the benefits of that are, that's the that's the breeding ground of disease so there's actually an immunity benefit yeah. by the way and this may be way off the line i want you to talk about the immunity benefits of having more skeletal muscle did you do you think that any of that had anything to do even when there was a pandemic that people that had more skeletal muscle either got through their symptoms of the pandemic faster or survived it at a higher rate than because we know obese people had these comorbidities that would contribute to their death but i'm even wondering about the pace at which you burn through the disease itself. We know that the more healthy skeletal muscle mass you have, the, be the better your survivability against nearly all cause uh, mortality and morbidity wow. against disease. And in fact, low muscle mass is a greater risk in any kind of fall movement than higher body fat. Okay. Okay. So skeletal muscle loss is more detrimental to health and wellness than, in my opinion, gaining body fat. Wow. And here's one of the reasons why it's not really highlighted yet is because up until recently, your mind is going to be blown. Okay. We don't measure skeletal muscle mass directly. Okay. So we have decades and decades of literature 
oh. that use these um, experimental endpoints that are extrapolations. Mm -hmm. We have based a paradigm of thinking not directly measuring the organ system that we're talking about. Wow. And by doing that, we've really underserved the power of skeletal muscle in the literature, and that's gonna change. There's some really interesting, I was looking at a, a paper, it was talking about, it doesn't really matter, but mm -hmm. D3 creatine, this way of directly now measuring skeletal muscle, mm -hmm. and people were saying that, uh, or the literature really pointed out the fact that we've always been using DEXA, or mm -hmm. uh, these normal modalities that are available for research and, and clinical indications, but don't really, measure skeletal muscle directly. So that's interesting. So there's not a lot of data that would tell us one way or the other because we haven't been measuring it accurately. What's your optimal muscle mass, Ed? I have no idea. I don't either. Hmm. Yet I do have a general idea of what I would want my body fat to be or not be. Exactly. Right? Or my heart rate to be or not exactly. be. Exactly. Yeah, that's a great point. Gabrielle. Why are we not that's measuring skeletal point. muscle? That's a great we point. We know that the gain and the loss of skeletal muscle is much more detrimental to health and wellness, yet you go to the physician and they're not saying, how much do you squat? Where's your squat at? You're right. You're right. It's funny. Let me ask you this question. This is a hard one. I think you look great. You know that. You do look great. But what if some women listening to this said, I don't want the appearance of too much muscle on my body because I think that's not a feminine look for somebody. And by the way, you have to have been asked this before. It's got to be something that occurs to me. Now, a man listening to this is like, yeah, let's pack on the muscle. But there are some, I think there's a segment of women that go, man, too much muscle on my body, at least the external evidence of it, doesn't seem as feminine to me. And, and that I, might be true, but how difficult is it to put on skeletal muscle? I don't know. You tell it's us. It's really tough. Mm -hmm. It's really tough. You are not going to, whoops, by mistake, look jacked and tanned. Okay, good It's point. just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. It is difficult to put on skeletal muscle. It, it is. It, you know, it's a currency. It's a health currency. Mm -hmm. And it's the only currency that can't be bought, sold, or bargained for. Mm. And who you become in that process of putting on skeletal muscle mm. has a whole other impact. It, well, I gotta tell you, wellness. evidentially, like with you, one of the first things she will usually ask me when we get together and go through my well being is, how's your energy level? How are you feeling? And I find that most of the time, regardless of what my pace and my schedule is, my answer is usually, I feel great. Because I do have these reserves of energy. I didn't know why, but now after reading the work of my doctor, I'm like, well, maybe that's why. Let's talk about some of the other, let's talk about building it and developing it at the same time. We'll keep spinning around here a little bit. But you talk a lot about protein, particularly meat protein. <laughs> So here we go. Like you're going to get a bunch of DMs. You're and just going to throw messages. me right into the fire. Well, well, yeah, because you're one of the few people who are like, nope, protein's incredible. You need a lot of it, and you can get it from meat, and that's okay. Yeah. So let's talk protein yeah. first. Just let's just let you go on okay. that, and then also your crusade. I guess I would call it <laughs> against like fake meat or whatever. I mean, it's just so silly. Okay. You have to understand the reason I care, mm -hmm. and the reason I do this isn't because it's so comfortable or so fun. Mm -hmm. It's because I have a responsibility. Because I have been, you know, at the bedside of way too many dying people. Mm. And that impacts you. Yeah. And maybe I'm just a sensitive doctor or whatever, but, mm. you know, after seeing 30 patients day after day after day mm. that are, okay, well, th is this person on hospice? Is this person taking, you know, their last breath? You just go, mm. what are we doing? Mm. How, why is our healthcare like this? Yeah. Why is this how it's going? Mm. And so, and this, I started seeing this influx in social media, of do this and do that. And I started seeing some of the worst advice mm. that no geriatrician, no physician that takes care of individuals that are aging would ever give people. Mm. Mm. And here's the part that I fight for mm. is the people that are in the middle that are trying their hardest and they don't know what to do. Right. Because there's so much information out there. Conflicting each other. Conflicting each mm -hmm. other and then the window of opportunity, the window of opportunity closes for people. Mm -hmm. And if you don't nail it, mm -hmm. then the repercussions of having an influencer in your ear saying one thing, it's not just about like, it's no longer cute on Instagram. These are people's lives we're talking about. Right. I want to stay on the, the protein part. For I'll a go back to the protein. Okay. I, I'm going to yeah. tell you a story. Okay. Uh, part of my book, um, by the way, it's 400 pages. They made me cut out at least 150. <laughs> is that I looked at the history. 
Okay. If we look back at the history, then we can understand why we are where we are today. Okay. Mm-hmm. Nutritional science is a relatively new field. They decided that isolated vitamins, 19, I mean, they started to isolate, but they started to really understand around 1910 to 1920, that mm-hmm. if you have a deficiency of this vitamin, you'll get scurvy. If right. you have a deficiency of that vitamin, that, that could be an issue. Went through World War I, had the Great Depression. On the heels of the Great Depression, and when we were facing Hitler and facing World War II, they drafted a million men, a million soldiers. Mm-hmm. The first million... 38% of them were unfit for war. Mm. This is when America's back is up against the wall. Mm. They need to protect and save their country. Right. Nutrition at that moment became a national crisis. <laughs> then they started initiating um, pamphlets and teaching. They felt like this was a real threat to our survival as a nation. Mm. They issued one recommendation to help Uncle Sam. They rec- issued another recommendation to help Hitler. Okay, this is in 1940. Do you know what, when, and, and their goal was, we need to get these men strong and capable so they can fight and they can be courageous. We need them to be able to work in the factories if they are not going to war because we have to build. Okay. Are you ready for the recommendations? Uh, what? Uh, without a doubt, eat a lunch that was high in protein yeah. for muscle health. In the 40s, liver, beef, eggs, Mm. chicken. Mm. Do not eat processed foods. Mm. Have a high-protein diet. We need you strong and vital Mm. in the 40s. That's awesome. If you wanted to feed and help Hitler, Mm. here's what you would do. You would eat processed foods. You would give up your protein. Really? I will show you these images. In the 40s, we recognize something. And then somewhere along the line, um, processed foods came in and we had money and politics and all of these things begin to change. We were no longer, and even right now, we are no longer just having conversations of nutrition. Mm -hmm. We are having conversations of nutrition uh, that are cloaked with morality and politics. Yeah, that's true. And the only reason I say this is because once we start talking about protein, People are going to have very visceral and emotional experiences. I'm, I'm really glad you framed it that way because they do. They do. It's a macronutrient. Mm-hmm. There is no emotion involved. <laughs> we have emotion because we have been culturally trained to have emotion about this, mm-hmm. and that has created a discourse and a smokescreen for people. Yeah, I definitely believe that. When I even tell people that I eat red meat, sometimes like, you know, their face changes instantly. Like I'm. Yeah, doing something horrible. I'm like, well, so I have I'm to bring to this up. I just have to frame this because the goal is to reach as many people as we can. Yep. And the only way to do that is if we say, please lower your guard, open your mind, mm-hmm. and just listen. And you believe, though, you, there should be meat protein in your diet. I absolutely believe that to yep. be true. Yep. yep. We evolved on this. Mm-hmm. It is the most highly bioavailable source of protein. What if someone's getting, let me go through this, so fake meat versus real meat? I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that we have a planet to feed. Mm -hmm. Do we have the resources to do it? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I know that we will figure it out. Mm -hmm. But I will say. But right now, as of the time of this recording, there's no comparison between the two for you. Maybe someday there will be. No. Okay. And there shouldn't be any comparison for you or anybody else. And if the conversation is about nutrition, then there's no question. If the conversation is about morality and something else and some other, you know, um, processed foods like these Impossible Burgers mm-hmm. are under a ju- different jurisdiction than commodities mm-hmm. like beef and egg and soy and corn. Mm-hmm. Collectively, you're a, a numbers guy. Collectively, their marketing budget for commodities is $750 million for all of them. Mm-hmm. For all the milk that you've ever heard. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you, don't, you don't know the individual milk farmers. They're all mm-hmm. collectively putting money. One company, PepsiCo, is almost $2 billion. Shit, really? Who controls the narrative yeah. is the person who has the money. Not only that, a commodity can't say, can't come to its own defense. Mm-hmm. Beef can't say, this is a product that is better for you and more bioavailable than the fake meat. Mm-hmm. 
because it's under the USDA. Yeah. Oh, I get it. They're they're, re- they're they regulated. They are regulated. Really- they cannot be disparaging against another food source. Mm-hmm. Whereas Impossible Burger or any processed foods can make multiple claims, like it's better for the environment, mm-hmm. or this is better for heart disease, mm-hmm. or these oats are better for heart disease than, I don't know, mm-hmm. um, this steak or fish or whatever it is. In general, uh, in general, how much protein should somebody getting per day? Is that based on their body weight and size? Like in yeah. general? In general, uh, my recommendation would be double the RDA, which is the minimum to prevent deficiencies. So the RDA is 0.37 grams per pound. Really that low? Yeah. So the so wow. for a 115 pound woman, that would be 45 grams of protein. Wow. That's just crazy. That's low. the minimum to prevent yeah. deficiencies. Okay. A better number would be 0.7 okay. gram to one gram per pound ideal body right. weight. I mean, I know when we start working there, you're like, I want a pound per body weight. Like that's what you For you. Yeah. I mean, you have yeah. a lot of muscle to maintain. Mm-hmm. We want to keep you lean. Mm-hmm. We want to keep your visceral fat down. Mm-hmm. And we... We want to keep that muscle full for what you. What about, uh, and I know we have very good friends who own these companies, but sources other than, you know, impossible meat or protein, but like getting some of that supplementation through protein drinks. It's really great. It's really, it is, and this is where the idea of processed food becomes challenging, right? Because mm-hmm. people say, oh, well, that's processed. Right. That's okay, because I would much rather have someone get a processed source like a whey protein mm-hmm. you and i both know the frisellas yes. i mean you know we work with first yep. form and yep. um hi guys uh yeah. they make a great whey protein okay. and whey protein would be a great is it is great and also has immunoglobulins okay. and it's an animal-based uh right. protein source and it's not to say that plant protein sources aren't great mm-hmm. but we are up against a narrative that if we listen to what is out there we will we're already metabolically dysfunctional Mm-hmm. We've already, with the information that we've given, the idea of now further reducing dietary protein mm-hmm. or replacing high quality nutrients like red meats, lean red meats, um, fish, and chicken, you know, this idea of having a meatless Monday, mm-hmm. what is that going to do? Mm-hmm. Agriculture, in and of itself, is 9% of all greenhouse gas in the US. Mm-hmm. You are loaded with this, Wait, man. Wait, 9%. You already, wow. so, so basically, if if it's 9%, that's including crops. So that's 3 point. So if we're talking about cattle, right. that might be 3.4%. You're mm-hmm. never going to eat. So so if you never ate meat again, your impact on greenhouse gas because uh, of cattle, right? And we're not even talking about that we use it for leather or that mm-hmm. we use it for soap. It'd be 3.4%. Well, but you'll die sooner, so you won't be wait, using it. Wait, wait, wait. By what evidence? <laughs> you won't be along to pollute you the environment. You will die sooner if you are overweight. <laughs> right. Dietary protein. No, I'm saying you'll die sooner if you don't eat the meat. I'm saying you'll die sooner. <laughs> but I mean, like, you think about these yeah. things. So we're talking about don't, you are never going to eat your way out of climate change. Right. Yeah. It I, is a divisive smoke screen. Yep. Yeah, it's something for all of you to evaluate. One of the reasons I wanted her on here is like, evaluate. First off, this is revolutionary stuff when it just comes to skeletal muscle healthy skeletal muscle. It's not something that's talked about. All of the ancillary benefits, everything correlated to it, everything connected to it. It's something all of you, no matter whether you're fit or not, need to evaluate from immune issues to fat burning to longevity, uh, all of it. Okay. So that's number one. Number two, to do that, how much protein are you getting and where are you getting it from? You're probably not, I, I'm not the doctor you are. I'm saying what you've just said, <laughs> but I want to, I want to unpack it. You're probably not getting enough. You've that's probably right. been misled about how much you get. Why? This book is so loaded, you guys, and I want you to get it, but like, she has this little piece in here on benefits of protein-forward diet, balanced blood sugar, increased energy, mental clarity, decreased body fat, improved body composition, reduced cravings, and that's a huge one. So for me, I've noticed when you told me, hey, what are you really doing? And I'm, I was having a lot of processed foods. I've noticed for me, and I'd like you to speak to this, that these processed foods that I ate, they didn't really satiate me. Like I was hungrier yeah. within the hour as opposed to actually eating real protein. I feel like I'm full when I eat real protein. Yeah. Is that like just me or is that most no, people? No, and I, and I do want to clarify something. I am all about high quality protein. You could definitely be vegetarian or vegan and get away with it. Mm-hmm. But again, do I feel like that's best? I don't. Mm-hmm. Does it have to be red meat for the people out there who don't want to eat red meat? It doesn't, but you really have to evaluate why are you choosing not right, like to. There's that, I think Arnold Schwarzenegger and some other people have gone vegan or already. And I mean, that's the worst thing that you can do for aging. Mm. Uh, that is the worst. Your survivability as you age is related to your muscle mass. Mm. And again, and I'm going to circle back to this satiation part, is that 
protein, we speak about it generically as if it's one thing. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's 20 different amino acids, Mm. all of which are in different ratios. Mm. And they do different things. We don't have a requirement for, quote, protein per se. Mm -hmm. We have a requirement for those amino acids. Okay, stay on that. You're reading my dang mind Ah. today. Because I want people to go, yeah, I'm supposed to just put on more muscle mass. I got it. No, why and how? Yeah. And and again, muscle is a pinnacle of health and wellness. And with a conversation that we have about muscle, we have to have that about protein. Protein is essential. Carbohydrates you can make. Mm-hmm. Fat, you don't really need that much. You have an essential fatty acid need. Everything that I am looking at with you right now mm-hmm. is made up of protein. Mm-hmm. Your hair, your skin, your nails, your muscle. Like, mm-hmm. you cannot survive with no protein. Okay? okay? Like, it, it just doesn't happen. Okay. This is what we are eating for. And again, there are 20 different amino acids and the listener doesn't have to think, oh my gosh, I got to know all of them. You don't. But what you have to understand is that each food, we eat in a food matrix. We're not just eating uh, arginine or you're not just eating leucine. I mean, you could be, but mm-hmm. you know, as a food, you're not. And that these individual amino acids, for example, arginine is an amino acid that is a precursor for something called nitric oxide, mm-hmm. which lowers blood pressure. Mm-hmm. If you are potentially arginine deficient and you improve the quality of your diet, you may see a lowering of your blood pressure. And an improved sexual function if you're a man, (laughs) right? I mean, that's what I'm thinking about. But that's actually true, right? Yes. Threonine is another amino acid. This is important for mucin production, for gut lining. Okay. Wow. Tryptophan is an amino acid that is incredibly important for serotonin production. Mm -hmm. Phenylalanine, we talked about for dopamine and leucine again they all have diverse roles wow leucine is responsible for muscle protein synthesis Mm -hmm. so i've just named four amino acids five amino acids that while we think about eating protein each of these individual nutrients have unique and necessary roles in the body so good so if we optimize and eat for muscle health you will meet those needs and those targets for the other amino acids. Mm. So medicine and muscle-centric medicine is the modality that I'm using to get people healthy. And by getting them to target skeletal muscle, everything else falls into place. This is so good. This is why I wanted you on. See, everybody, I told you. (laughs) I bring you people every week. You're like, how do I get access to these people? Listen to the dadgum show. So... I want to go one, through one more thing on eating, and then I want to go through training, like gym stuff, for a second, too, okay? Because that's been, you've made major changes for me in that. But let's go back from it. One of the things you say in the book that I didn't know is that your, your body's 60 40 water protein, right? <laughs> like, because you said everything you're looking at. But also, that's just something for me, I always said, like, you're 80% water your body. In the book, you say you're 60% water, basically 40% protein. In general, that's true. So these are just things to know. But also, I want to talk to you about intermittent fasting because in the book, you talk about how important breakfast is. Yes. Right? Yes. So so this was interesting to me to read because you and I have talked a lot about this with me too. It doesn't matter. My own care is my own care. That's not for the show today. But what about intermittent fasting, your opinion about that, and then the importance though of breakfast? Yes. So here we go. Um, Let's talk about intermittent fasting. And there's multiple ways to do intermittent fasting and Mm -hmm. it's eating, it's typically defined, will define it as eating into... Um, a feeding in an eight to nine hour window, Mm -hmm. right? And then the rest of the time that you're fasting. Mm -hmm. Now, people use intermittent fasting as this compressed feeding window. Mm -hmm. And many people talk about pushing it later on in the day. Don't eat till noon, don't eat till two. But when you do that, there is an impact on your circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. And circadian Mm -hmm. rhythm is these 24 hour light dark cycles Mm -hmm. that we see and also our body exists in an environment where we also have our own circadian rhythm. Okay. When you push breakfast back, you affect and impact the circadian rhythm. Mm. And the evidence would support at least some of the emerging evidence that that's not ideal. Mm. It's not it's not ideal. Okay. I recommend eating earlier on yeah. within the first hour to 2 hours you wake up because you're setting the stage for this circadian entrainment. Great. And wow. not only that, the data for the, this muscle protein synthesis mm-hmm. that we talk about 
if you nail that first meal, mm -hmm. where all the data, to my knowledge, all the experiments have been done on that first meal. Mm. Okay. We know that that meal has massive impact. Okay. And it has massive impact in a number of ways. Number one, your skeletal muscle coming out of an overnight fast is primed. Okay. You are primed for this incorporation of amino acids. You've been sleeping. Your body is using the amino acids from skeletal muscle. You hit between 30 on a low day. For you personally, I would want you to have 40 grams to 50 grams of protein at that first meal. Okay. You hit that, you maximize muscle protein synthesis. Okay. We now have just addressed muscle health. Mm -hmm. I've already told the listener about the other benefits from the amino acids that they're getting. Mm -hmm. Satiation, the evidence supports that when you have breakfast and a breakfast that is high in protein, the brain doesn't light up when it sees a donut. Mm -hmm. You are much less likely to be driven to feed on things that are outside of your plan. This is very good right here. And mm. it stabilizes your blood sugar. Mm. You don't have to eat carbohydrates to maintain your blood sugar. Mm. When you ingest dietary protein, these some of these amino acids go through this process called gluconeogenesis, where they generate glucose. The body generates its own glucose from the amino acids that you provide it mm. in a way that is stable. So you are not chasing ebbs and flows of blood sugar. Your body is making the glucose it needs. Very, very good, you guys. We, uh, you switched this on me two visits ago, and I just, I just feel better. Just to be honest with you, I'm not like ravenous at 11 a.m. I'm not like scarfing <laughs> when I eat, and I didn't really realize that my body's being primed to take the protein. And the other thing for me, maybe this is just me. But most people work out in the morning. Like a lot of people work out in the morning. So this idea of waking up and I haven't eaten, there's really, you know, I'm, def I'm feeling a little bit deficient. Then I train really hard. Then I'm still waiting two or three more hours to eat. Just doesn't seem smart in building muscle to me. Is there any timing involved when the protein's in your body relative to uh, building question. muscle? Great question. The data would suggest, and I'm going to say this cautiously mm -hmm. because there's a little bit of nuance here. Okay. The data would suggest if we are thinking about a protein hierarchy for someone who is fit and healthy like you, it's the 24-hour protein consumption that matters. Okay, not the on the hour or... Correct. Okay, great. Okay. But if you believe what I just said, mm -hmm. that and also the evidence supports this first meal, mm -hmm. then regardless of this idea of how much protein you get in the day, there are other strategies that can be leveraged for optimization. Okay. Okay, so... Uh, and I just want to be very clear because there are some nuances in, in the science. So I'm going to do my best to explain it okay. in a way that is applicable okay. for everybody. Okay. Protein quality, uh, the amount of protein that you're getting. So for you, let's say it's probably not quite 200 grams, but maybe it's 200 grams of protein. Mm -hmm. Number one, I don't care when you're eating your protein around your workouts okay. as long as you're getting it in. Okay. Now, if someone is older... If you are listening to Ed's show and you are older, or maybe you're struggling with your weight, or you have some kind of chronic illness, or you just are struggling with your health, I'm going to give you a few strategies, okay. which I, I lay these out in the book, that there's ways in which you can distribute protein that may be more beneficial. Interesting. For example, an older individual, let's say older, maybe they haven't been active, we'll just say 60. Okay. But again, you can have muscle problems. These diseases of skeletal muscle begin in your 30s. Okay. This idea of sarcopenia mm -hmm. that everyone says is, age, I mean, this is a disease of younger years, my friend. Okay. They're just, they didn't even give it an ICD-9 code till 2016. Mm -hmm. They didn't even acknowledge muscle as a disease of um, la lack of muscle mass and function till 2016. That's bananas All right. to me. It's bananas. Yeah. I'm going to, I mean, I don't want to get sidetracked, but first, after you train, there's evidence to support, and we saw these in older in older individuals, that an older or unhealthy muscle will have as robust of a response as a younger person. Mm -hmm. Because exercise primes the muscle with uh, blood flow. It it like ups this threshold of being able to respond to amino acids. By the way, skeletal muscle, which I forgot to tell you, mm -hmm. is a nutrient sensing organ. It senses the quality of your diet hmm. through these amino acids, in particular leucine. Okay. So what I would want someone to do who is aging is to train, do some kind of resistance training, 
and then have their protein shortly after. Okay. Okay. Super duper easy. Yeah. Right. Like what's after within the hour? I mean, listen, it could be, um, yeah, sure. You could pick a time. But I mean, again, the closer that you can do it, you don't have to be crazy. So someone older who's not fit, somewhere uh, protein distribution matters. Someone who is, sounds to me like someone who is already fit, who's already been training, you're more concerned about the 24-hour yeah, consumption. I don't, I don't care so much about protein distribution. Okay. Um, someone who wants to lose weight, I do care about protein distribution. Okay. And here's why. I care about protein distribution because we have to manage their blood sugar yeah. and we have to manage their hunger. And protein is a way of augmenting your willpower mm. because of the way in which these different amino acids affect gut function and satiety hormones. Okay. So if you are trying to lose weight, and I outline this in the book, I recommend an even distribution of dietary protein. Mm -hmm. Start with 30 grams of protein three times a day. If you don't know what that is, it could be four ounces of, close to four ounces of a chicken or beef if you don't want to do that. You could start with a protein shake. You know, you can Google what does 30 or go on my Instagram, what is 30 grams of protein? Yeah. And it'll tell you. And that's a great way to manage your weight. Okay. If you are looking for hypertrophy, I suggest four meals a day, really optimizing for dietary protein, a 20% increase into what your maintenance calories are. Mm. And I don't want to go too deep into this for the listener though, because if it's one thing that I want them to take away is I want them to take away two things from this conversation. Okay. Muscle is the organ of longevity. And number two, dietary protein will help protect your skeletal muscle as you age. Like it is everything, regardless of what you're hearing. And then three, if we want to put something in, uh, exercise is critical and probably even more, it has more of an impact. But what is the thing that everybody does? 100% of people eat. <laughs> So if I don't add, if we don't nail that, yeah. and I already told you, 24% of Americans are meeting their exercise criteria. That's crazy. So we, we got to grab the low-hanging fruit. fruit. Okay, now let's go to the higher-hanging fruit, uh, <laughs> which is the training part. So um, in general, what should somebody be doing in terms of resistance training? Let's just be honest. You want them lifting weights. I do. Right, and I don't think that it's actually just said that bluntly to people. That, and I, I again, I this stuff is not gender specific, but in general, I think more men accept the fact they should resistance train. Isn't that interesting? It, it is, and I don't know what that is. I where just, where did that come from culturally? I don't know, but I think we would both agree that it's true. Even if you walk into any given gym, you will see most men resistance training. And most women on the treadmill machine. Correct. That's usually the distribution of it, or they'll do the treadmill and very light, right. like, real quick, 10 or 15 minutes. That's not. This is a big generalization, but I think everybody would agree with me. In general, it's sort of... You know, common for men to do resistance training and not quite as common for women to do it. And I think part of that even still goes to this I don't want to get too muscular or too big, which is really a kind of a crazy notion, especially if you don't have any real so uh, muscle mass right that. now. I call that a distraction. Mm -hmm. I call that, uh, I don't want to do this, this is uncomfortable, and this is a distraction. And it's a very easy, convenient excuse not to do it. Super easy. So in general, let's talk about resistance training. How much should somebody do? How regularly? And to any other recommendations yeah. well, correlated with it? Well, the first thing that I would love to highlight is that there is this conversation that just some exercise is better than none. I don't think we should say that. Okay. I think that that is wrong information and it's holding people to a much lower standard. Mm. And we shouldn't be saying that. Mm. And just a side note, I don't think we should be setting, quote, goals. We need to begin to set standards for ourselves. Love it. You know, I love How that. are we setting standards? I love it. So here is my recommendation. There is no um, replacement for resistance training. And this okay. is not to offend doing yoga. And I, people get very upset about their modality mm -hmm. of exercise. Mm -hmm. God forbid that there is a problem. I need to be able to lift my 40-pound four-year-old up yeah. and uh, throw my other two-year-old on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. And if I need to sprint and lift both of those little suckers, mm -hmm. I got to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. You have to train for real life. We are not training to do a bicep curl. Yes, go ahead and do it. It's great. You're releasing myokines. Mm. We live in a physical world. Great. We have become domesticated. Mm. You must do training. You have to be a functional, mm. capable, viable human. Mm. Okay, three days a week, 
you can do th- if that's the minimum I would suggest. Okay, as you say and, in the book, it's three. Yes, yeah, right? it's yeah. the minimum, and yeah. I provide a. Mm. You know, I did even a workout. I did eighty workout videos for this book. It's awesome. I could never be a fitness influencer. Well, <laughs> I, I have news for you. I think you kind of <laughs> no. are. but go ahead. Just like God, this yeah. is really hard. Right. Um, so in the book, I talk about this. So three days a week of resistance training, ten sets per muscle group. Sounds like a lot. Does it have to be? No, but this is start with three days a week. Mm-hmm. I also think there needs to be one day a week of high intensity interval training. Mm-hmm. That has a very broad, that's a very broad uh, generic recommendation. Can we stay on that one thing just for a second? Yes. I'm always going to try to jump in on something. That's not necessarily for fat burning, is it? Or is it much more for heart health and well being? It is for using your body and pushing its capacity. Got it. In okay. my opinion. Okay. Because with that, you have to mentally prepare. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this is this is how I think about it as a physician. Mm-hmm. It improves insulin sensitivity. Okay? okay, you are using your body and improving again cardiac health. Right, mm-hmm. you're going to improve your VO2 max. Mm-hmm. You're going to be able to do things in a, a certain amount of time that maybe perhaps you don't have time for. Like, I, I don't see you doing that's, long that's, rucks. That's why I love it. When you <laughs> recommend it, it's funny. Yeah. You and Amy at the same week, my heart doctor. Hi, Amy. I yeah. just yeah. messed up. I'm like, if the, you talk to Ed. My, <laughs> yeah, my care between these two women is pretty awesome. But the same week you both said it to me, and it was like a great out for me. I'm like, oh, gosh, I could do my cardio in 20 or 25 minutes. Yeah. This is awesome. Yes. And I love the exertion part of it. Right. I love it. By the way, the mental part. It's like, you know, to me, 45 minutes on the treadmill, which is good. It's no problem. It's like, I, I'm just, it's just like mindless. 20 minutes of interval training. I'm like, I got to get focused. I got to get, I don't want to go to the sprint the next one and I do it. Totally. And then when I'm done, I feel a thousand times yeah. better on interval training than what I do when I just do 45 yeah. mindless minutes. That's yeah. just me. I'm like, I just did something hard. Yeah. And I love that feeling. Yeah. And and you're also moving substrates out of your skeletal muscle. Okay. And again, whether you are improving mitochondria function, you're doing all of the things and you're being very efficient and effective. Okay. And I think that that's important. And that's not, and so high intensity interval training also helps with muscular endurance, um, you know, the fatigability of Mm -hmm. your tissue. So there's all types of benefits. And again, there is somewhat of a continuum, Mm -hmm. but we can start with three days a week of resistance training going to, people say, well, you don't have to go to failure or you can lift heavy or light. Yes, but you know what? Dial it in here in your mind okay. and put the amount of effort where it feels like effort. Mm-hmm. You know, okay. It's not just mm-hmm. like the mindless mm-hmm. uh, presses. Should someone be tracking their weight then? I you know, do. Like, yeah, yes, of I course. I don't see enough of that either. And I've stopped it and I need to get back. But like for years and years and years, it was pretty common in the gym to go, hey, I did you know 10 reps at 80 pounds or whatever it is. And then to be tracking that and have the goal to yes. get it to 90 and 100. Yes. One thing that's really interesting to me when I go to the gym is seeing, I've seen this dude do the same exact weight for six straight years on the bench, the same reps, the same weight. And I'm thinking, do you have any goals or ambitions or standards to get stronger and improve? Like, that's the cool thing to me about the gym is that you can see gains and improvement. But if you're not, where where performance is measured, performance improves, right? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And then, you know, if you can, I used to do um, some kind of cardiovascular training like zone two. But again, do you have to? Mm -hmm. You don't. I would much rather people start with um, muscular health in the way of resistance training. Okay. And again, that's just defined as moving something against force. But I have to tell you, I believe that picking up a free weight or picking up a kettlebell is and, you know, it translates to real life. And by the way, she does. I just want to make sure you all know. She knows that I'm doing more yoga and stretching now and sort of, you know, trying to elongate my spine and do these other things. Because when you do resistance training for a long time, those things are important. So I just want to make clear that her stance on that and her belief in it, she's very strong on that. You said something to me when we first started working together as it terms to training. I'm sure you remember this. Of course I do. And I think you know what I'm going to ask you. But we were, we were, I was telling you, I'm working out at the house. You remember this? Of course. I said, I'm working out at the house and it's really convenient. And I'm nowhere near getting the same workout as when I do at the gym. So I want everybody to hear this because it's something for you to evaluate too. Those of you that are like, hey, you know, I put the kids off at school and then I get home and I've got some kettlebells in the living room and I'm doing something. By the way, maybe great for you as opposed to going to a gym. Like, you know, I just built this huge gym on my island, but I built it. One of the reasons I built it so big is it feels like I'm in a damn gym again and I'm going to get people in there training with me because you said to me, about the different workout type personalities. Yeah. So just just share them because I think it's really important yeah. to know. I know when I've really trained my ass off. Right. 
And almost never, never for me at the house, do I go, man, that was ballistic. I, I'm at exhaustion. I can't, I can't, I'm throwing up from doing legs. Never at the house. Right. But when I go to the gym. You better show up, my friend. Right. It's a little different. So why is that? And is that everybody or the personality type thing you described? Well, first, let me highlight this um, privilege of being a physician. Mm-hmm. As a physician, a good physician is capable at seeing patterns of disease right this is the what you expect a good physician to be able to do an effective physician sees patterns of people so good so good so when you told me Mm -hmm. that you were at home working out Mm -hmm. you are not the archetype of a person that does that we are never going to get the best out of you in isolation Ever. Mm-hmm. Meaning me. You. My personality your type. Right. Your archetype right. as a human yep. will never perform mm-hmm. physically in a space of isolation. Yep. And you had been doing that mm-hmm. and you weren't happy with your body composition. You mm-hmm. weren't feeling great. Yep. But you're like, I'm working out. Yes. You are somewhat of a performer. Mm-hmm. You don't have to. You don't want to go to the gym where people are, quote, recognizing you and mm-hmm. coming up to you. But you need to be witnessed Mm -hmm. because if you are witnessed, you will never stop working. It's one of the most brilliant things anyone ever said to me. So one of the reasons I left going to the gym was that I was being recognized too much. And I was telling you, I can't get I love meeting people, but I can't get through a workout. And my following is very gym based. Right. So I'm going in the gym. And I just can't get through set. So I'm like, I'm going to start working out at the house. And, you, and I said to you, it wasn't working. And you said, you're a performer. Now, why is this so important for you all to hear? This woman is so brilliant because it's the observance of people and their bodies that she does both of. You need to ask yourself that question too, like truthfully. Now, maybe you are somebody who you're so adverse to attention that maybe you would be more free and train harder in isolation. I'm sure there's a personality. There's, well, there are some people that... But it's small, right? It's small. There yeah. are, and there are some people that you put them, they're like the chameleon. Mm-hmm. You dropped my one of my best friends, Don Saladino. Yeah. He is just jacked. Yeah. You put him anywhere yeah. and he's just like, by himself, he's training. Yes. It doesn't matter. Yep. He's just like a chameleon. You put him in any of these different places, and he'll go after it. Well, that's why I thought I would do it. Like, I'll watch The Rock on Instagram, and he seems that whatever he calls that gym of his, I'm like, this dude looks like it's him and his camera dude or him on his phone, and he's just crushing it. And maybe that's why he has a, a cameraman there. Maybe maybe he has the cameraman to help him, right? I In my case, I just know for me, it's for what – it's almost – there's something to me to the mental rep. I know this is bizarre, but getting in my car getting kind of ready, having my drink ready when I get there. Like, I'm dressed. I'm. I, there's an effort to get there. Then I walk in, it's like, bam, it's game time. Let's go, right? So there's something to me that when I go to a gym and there's some energy and some environment, as much as I wasn't enjoying the fact that I couldn't get through a workout, I've actually concluded now, like, I've got to create that environment where I'm performing and competing in a Someone gym. Someone has to be witnessing you. So good. So good. Okay. Um, I knew this was going to fly by and I'm not going to finish it. It's too, it's too much good stuff. It's about bone density, okay? So there's another benefit of all of this stuff as we age, and I think it's another thing that's, like, not discussed until someone you know that's old and falls and breaks their hip and they deteriorate, right? But there's a lot of reason to be concerned about and, and, and do things to benefit bone density. Yeah, bone density, again, is something that we see change especially as individuals age men and women Mm -hmm. quite frankly i mean it's certainly more rapid in women Mm -hmm. and bone density this is the physical architecture of your body Mm -hmm. how do you care for bone you have to train you have to put it under stress Mm -hmm. how do you do it you leverage skeletal muscle Mm -hmm. how else do you do it high quality dietary protein despite what you are hearing from the Mm -hmm. i don't know like the ph Whatever these conversations are, this mm. alkaline diet, none mm. of that. The, the body is highly regulated. Mm. Do you know what uh, bone is made from? Mm-mm. Protein. Mm. I didn't know that. Um, when I was doing my geriatric fellowship, we saw that those with the highest uh, amount of hip fractures were those with the lowest uh, in the lowest quartile group of dietary protein. Interesting. High quality dietary protein. Interesting. Now, see, that's interesting to me because that's actually 
genetically sort of in my family that there's bone density issues as people age. I don't think it's something I'm going to have to worry about because of all the protein and all the training that I do. And, you know, vitamin D and there's some calcium. There's nutrients that are also required. What about blood? Like getting your labs drawn. Like, obviously, you do mine constantly. Oh, but and I am annoying about it, aren't you I? You are. You are annoying <laughs> about it. I'm grateful that you are because I'm, I'm actually I'm doing it tomorrow. <laughs> actually, tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., I'm getting oh, the labs I'm drawn. I'm going to be ready to call Amy. But most people don't. Yeah, you have and to. And so they don't really know what's going on in their bodies because they don't have anybody. And maybe that's maybe I'm being maybe what I'm asking you sounds like a guy with some money things. It's not fair to ask people Wait who don't. Wait a second. But, it yeah. is. There are so many companies that literally can do it for ex- an extremely low cost. Okay, great. So without okay, insurance. Okay. Okay. You know. Like, so ha- ha- like, have you ever heard of Inside Tracker? Yeah. Okay. Yes. They'll okay. come to your house. It might be a hundred and some dollars. So in general, someone's twenty five years or older right now. Let's get say. your baseline testosterone levels checked. Mm-hmm. So you know where you feel the best when you are young. You will have a sense of what is your blueprint. Mm-hmm. What are we working off of? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, you, it's like literally you're reading my mind because we work together. Let's just talk about some of that. Like, let's get to the real, real, the hormone stuff, right? Yeah. And I've been open that I take testosterone for a very long time. Which, can I stop you for a second? Mm-hmm. The fact that we even have to say we have to be open about it. That's, what is the, What is going on? That's my point. And it's interesting. Like, at my age, I tell people this all the time. But by the way, even prior to this age, like at 40 or whatever it is, I know when I meet a dude whether he's on it almost instantly. He looks, he looks younger. He looks physically stronger. Now, by the way, I'm making an overly general statement, but my baseline testosterone was low, and my baseline testosterone started to really drop, and I needed it. But I feel almost bad sometimes, and then hopefully that person or this woman or that man will listen to the show today. But I'll meet a 50, 55, 60-year-old person, and I'm like, my gosh, you're... It seems to me anyway, you're aging prematurely so unnecessarily right. that if you would just increase your dietary protein, if you just move some weights around, right? If you just do some interval training, if you just get your labs drawn, yes. if you just get your hormone levels to where they're supposed to be to be a young, fit person, yet most people lack all of it, but they can do those other things and still hormonally not know they're in a, a, a deficient state that's going to make it very difficult to make any of these changes happen. Absolutely. And then part of the cultural conversation is, oh, my gosh, you're on testosterone. But no problem. I can prescribe you a medication that's going to make you less fat. Right. Good point. Really I good point. I can prescribe medication good that point. will make somebody reduce their obesity. But it's so controversial to prescribe a medication that's going to make you stronger. Gosh, you're You right. tell me why that is. Why is it? I don't know. Do you think it's because people think, like, uh, here's what I think it is. I think people correlate testosterone with, like, steroid abuse or something. I think there's got to be some bizarre, I get that there, there's testosterone derivatives in these other roids and stuff, and that somehow they're like, oh, you're on hardcore steroids because you're getting your hormone levels back to where they were when you were 30. That's. I think that's what it is. But let me ask you this. So if something can be done safely. Right. And within limits that have no negative outcomes because the dosing is physiologic and it's going to make someone protected against heart disease, yep. live longer, be stronger, and there's still a stigma attached? I think you're 100% right. My opinion being, let's just be clear here, we both know who the doctor is here, but I have this theory that like 20 years from now, we're going to look back at this era of life and where people were in their 50s, 60s, and 70s and not on some form of hormone replacement and think what a tragedy it was for these poor people who inexpensively, by the way, very yeah, inexpensively, yeah. Um, could have extended the prime of their life far longer. But there was a lack of information altogether or misinformation like what you just described. Do you kind of think that too? I think that... You know, like I look at my dad. Mm -hmm. My dad, he doesn't take anything. He's 74 years old. Mm -hmm. He lives in Ecuador. If if something can be walked to in under four hours, that guy walks it. I love it. I love it. I measure his blood work. His testosterone is 800. You, what? He's outside. He meditates. He what? Like works out. Yeah. That's awesome. So, so I mean, so the fact, so the fact that I interrupted you there, daggone it, because I'm so damn excited to hear that. So you're saying a lot of the people that are listening to this, if they're training regularly or genetically are benefited, maybe, they may need not it. I mean, maybe, but he definitely needs more muscle, mm. right? So mm. then the question becomes, well, how much do we put on to help protect individuals? Got it. But the point is, is that. Does a person have to be on hormone replacement? No. Do I think there should be this massive stigma? No. Mm-hmm. 
And we have created conversations that restrict my ability. Do you know that testosterone is not FDA approved for women? No. I didn't know but that. But don't worry. I can give you a drug that is going to make you less fat. That's so crazy. Isn't it also like a controlled substance? Yes. That's so bananas to yes. me. Yes. But it wasn't before the, these, the issue with sport. Mm. Somehow, again, it's uh, these narratives have existed without being questioned. That's nuts. By the way, we're both aware of the fact that there's some data that suggests that testosterone may suppress HDL to some extent. Like, there's there's potential that that's true, as long as it's being monitored and tracked. But also, though, right? what about this? Mm -hmm. There was, for years, um, so you know my husband, who was a SEAL, is now a surgeon. He's mm -hmm. a urologist. Mm -hmm. And he's a Baylor. And he works with some of the world-leading experts in testosterone replacement. Okay. Uh, Mohed Kara, for example. Okay. They no longer restrict testosterone replacement for prostate cancer patients. In fact, it's been shown to improve survivability. Okay, now you're really surprising me there. Wait a second. Yeah. Wow. There is no, that they do better. Wow, And wow, maybe it's wow. because they have more muscle, and, and there was this a study that came out, the Traverse trial, mm -hmm. that said that there wasn't a negative impact on cardiovascular health with testosterone replacement. Okay, that's awesome. That is awesome. But, but the yeah. point is, mm -hmm. We have these narratives mm -hmm. and these paradigms that remain unchallenged over time. Mm -hmm. You're 100% right. But by the way, your role in the world is so important. It, it, it really is true. Like, we're not making any, you're certainly not making any across the board. Even when I met you, you're like, I don't know whether you should take testosterone. Let me take your labs, right? What's your baseline? How's it work? So yeah. we're not talking about across the board recommendations here. But in general, like these stigmas of protein, these stigmas of hormone replacement, these are really very concerning things that you know I worry about it and when I meet people that are my age and I think man I feel like I know something you should know like you should be getting your labs drawn you should be pushing weights around you should be eating more protein and what about this there's this um, every time we talk about kids which you know I have mm -hmm. two very little children yeah. and in the book I was researching about exercise for children do you know that there isn't evidence to support that they shouldn't be doing resistance training when they're younger so it doesn't stunt your growth no. like we heard when we were yeah. but you see a mom and they're like, oh, your kid shouldn't be working out. Right. But I don't hear you saying you're worried about these ultra processed foods or the iPad time. You're right. But no, you're going to stunt that child's growth. Yeah. I'm watching Michael Hearn's little dude on Instagram. <laughs> I know. I'm like, man. I already, I've already married them off. Oh, have you really? So, oh, yeah. So Mona and Mike, we've already married uh, Titan and Aries off. I'm going to tell you. Titan has better traps and lats I know, than I have. I know. I always joke How with them. How old is he? Three or four? He's four. They're He's four. the same age. He's four. That's They're crazy. Man. What, you talk about a, a marriage I of... I already told them. Oh, my goodness. I love you, and I'm so grateful you're in my life, and I knew today was going to be incredible. By the way, we've gone an hour already. I Amazing. feel like we've been talking for like 25 minutes. She is a treasure of information, and here's the other reason I want you following her. Number one, by the way, get her book, Get Forever Strong, a new science-based strategy for aging well. But I also want you to follow her on social media, and here's why. Because over the next three and four and five and ten years, as more and more cutting-edge information comes out for nutrition, supplementation, these other things, this woman will be on the forefront of all of it. And so if you want to stay current, you want to stay modern, she is who you should be following to stay in the know right now and going forward. You all hear me on that? Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, that's who you should be following. Thank you. I love you. And thank oh, you for being I love here. you too. There's nothing I wouldn't do for you or your family. And I, you know this. I know that. You check in on me constantly <laughs> and my wife and my kids all the time. And that's why I'm so grateful for our friendship more than I am anything. And thank God made that big brain of yours. <laughs> thank God. I'm so happy. All right, Thanks everybody. So you got what you want out of today. I told you it would be an unbelievable show and that you would learn things you've not heard before. I know that we met that criteria. And because of that, Make sure you share the show. Somebody you know and love needs to hear what we talked about today. You know it and I know it. Fastest growing show in the world because you share the show. All right. I love you all very much. Max out your life. 